we still prefer carrots to sticks, but if the carrots aren't working, and this is the claim, it's a sad day. But I stay hopeful. But I will give a roundup update on how things are going specifically with regards to the different levels, meaning researchers, journals, universities, and funding agencies, and publishers. So for researchers, well, we're dealing with large-scale ethical crisis of unprecedented levels. Uh, and I know it sounds dramatic, but it's it's actually true if you bother to look at the evidence that we will be presenting. Uh, main one being the Nosek, Brian Nosek scandal, which is, involves him being opaque about his personal speaking fees. And then when confronted publicly on Twitter, he then quasi lies about his personal fees and his not being transparent about them. And so that, and then most people on Twitter reacted in an unbothered way or very upset at me for attacking him. So this is important, not just for the fact that a transparency champion could be violating the ethical co code of conduct with respect to transparency, but it's also a question of accountability to the taxpayer because NOSIC has received over $20 million in a grant funding from the U.S. public funding agency. And so the public is owed some, some answers because this case is really uh, raises a lot more questions than it answers. And also the accountability to the Center for Open Science Board of Directors, because he's the director of the Center for Open Science. He's getting paid $240,000 US per year to be an executive director. So it's it possible that his uh, conflicts of interest with regards to his implicit bias, the very political workshops, it's possible that, that these undisclosed, though now disclosed, or at least partially disclosed conflicts of interest, whether those conflicts of interest are interfering with his ability to fulfill his duties as a executive director of a research institute, or rather a tech company, a tech nonprofit, who is supposed to be increasing transparency, reproducibility, and integrity of research. And so concrete actions that we are moving forward on is, sadly, a wall of shame that would be updated uh, regularly on a public website, where unfortunately we would list any researchers who have not met the basic ethical core principles like honesty, transparency, um, scrupulousness, independence, I mean, these core principles. Um, and so we still prefer carrots to sticks, but if the carrots aren't working, and this is the claim that 10 years after Daryl Bam, or even 30 years since the 90s when the biomedical people started pushing for more transparency, uh, it's still a very small minority of publicly funded researchers actually share their data publicly and even, uh, never mind disclosing conflicts of interest, funding sources. And so the wall of shame would act as a way to enforce the ethical code of conduct because it's like the law. If no one enforces the law, then it defeats the purpose of having the law or the law is not being effective. So the same here, we have ethical codes of conduct in academia, 
in, in universities, but no one enforces them. So therefore, people can continue to be unethical, <laughs> which is the case. The majority of researchers admit we even have a, empirical evidence across seven fields now um, that they do use steroids, academic enhancement techniques to get results that are more publishable. So, uh, it's, so I mean, it's, it's right there. I mean, it, it makes sense for academics to use steroids, just like Tour de France. If you don't take the steroids, you don't stand a chance of competing. It's exactly the same problem. And that's why we need uh, to, to reform the standards at all levels, at funders, at the university level, at the journal level, and at the research level, where we're a lot more strict and we have a wall of shame. If you cross the line, you get warnings. I mean, we still have due process, so that's good to clarify. You're, pro you're, you're assumed innocent until proven guilty. You could be giving warnings, and then there's an investigation. You can appeal, and so on. I mean, but there has to be some kind of enforcement. Okay, so moving on to journals. Um, well, the story we're covering is these unethical retractions at journals of solid research, otherwise solid research, but that whose findings contradicts the mainstream political narrative of what could be called, I guess, woke culture or social justice movement. And so this is very concerning because, again, journals, they're, they're supposed to be trustworthy so that the public can say, oh, this is published in a journal. It should be more trustworthy than a random blog post or some crank at the park, <laughs> right? And so if they start having different standards for different kind of research, then it's basically the beginning of the end for journals uh, and for science, potentially. So there's this case at PNAS, big time journal, where uh, authors were co more or less coerced to retract their paper uh, due to pe political pressure and uh, and the retraction is, is unethical. I mean, there's actually a code of conduct for journals and publishers that they should follow where a retraction is only justified if, if there's been major errors, uh, major data problems, data integrity problems, uh, you, you know, data problems, problems with the analyses that that would change the conclusion. But this is not the case here. There was only contestation about what the results meant, right? The data is it's public, actually. So that's the, the big story. And there's countless other examples now, even with the COVID-related, um, where papers are being retracted due to political pressure. There was another one that I think was a doctor who had a paper where he questioned the front of action and his paper's getting retracted. So this is, you know, the solution is enforce the publication ethics standards. That's another entire ballgame. I looked into the COPE ethical body, which is the committee uh, uh, publication ethics or something, and they themselves are questionable. That's especially another story. Where they, you have to be part of this COPE ethics, it's more like a paying membership club. So they can't really enforce their own ethics because if there's a violation and there's a complaint, they basically always side with their customer, their client. I mean, so the, the the international body, ethical body, regarding publication integrity and 
ethics is itself acting unethically or at least having a conflicted <laughs> state. And uh, so next steps, concrete actions is also a wall of shame for journals. And again, we, we also will have a leaderboard, transparency leaderboard. So get out the carrots. We, we already um, have dedicated some of the trans transparency standard uh, names to the leading journals like Metapsychology and Plus One. But there has to be a wall of shame where um, journals who don't require a minimum of transparency standard, they'll be on the wall of shame so, so that, you, that you cannot trust their papers. Right? Because transparency is a minimum criteria. Like, so, of course, a transparent paper could still be unreliable, like if you don't check. Right? But something that's not transparent can't even be checked. And then it, moving forward or more in the distant future, the journal rankings could also include uh, credibility rankings where we try to assess uh, the extent to which transparent findings withstand scrutiny, the different kinds of scrutiny like critical commentaries, reproducibility reanalyses, robustness reanalyses, and then replications, right? Um, but that's difficult, but that would be the ultimate kind of prestige index. So, so some people want to get rid of prestige. Of course, we should get rid of prestige based on impact factor. Because, um, that's very silly, but, but we can replace it with the ultimate prestige in science is actually discovering something that withstands the most ruthless scrutiny by the most number of people, right? So if we can capture that in a, a, a nuanced index, then that would be very useful. Okay, and then moving on to uh, universities. Um, the update is we are considering a more aggressive tactics well, same with publishers, to try to get people to listen. Money talks. So for universities, we're proposing to basically cut funding to the universities, both federally and provincially, if they don't ensure their own researchers are meeting the Tri-Council's minimum transparency standard. And uh, they're... They're dying for money. I mean, COVID has hurt their revenue flows, and there's a growing awareness that university education is not as valuable as we used to think, which is well do documented in many books, and the dumbing down of academia, and just ent ent infotainment, and grade inflation, and so on, and gender studies, and social justice, and the woke it's the wokeism has ruined a lot of universities like Evergreen State College and um, and then well wall of shame as well I guess which would replace the what the heterodox academy used to do uh, so yeah that's good to put some pressure on universities and again, wall of shame, but also leaderboards for who, which, which are the most transparent researchers at what universities are the, <laughs> the you rank the universities by the proportion of researchers with a transparent track record. All right. <laughs> Oh, man. Don't laugh. I have uh, anxiety and a whole host of other psychopathologies. So I'm the victim. You're not allowed to laugh at me. At least I'm not a stutterer. Which would be really horrible. So I'm not 
making fun of stutterers. I'm actually sympathizing because anxiety is a bit similar. Uh, and then the university is also, as part of receiving grant money, sorry, uh, so for universities who receive public funds, they are required to show that they are using transparency track record of researchers in their hiring of them and in the promotion of them. Uh, so again, it's just part of the, the, the condition. And if you don't do that, then you lose the grant funding. Okay, and the final category is at the funding agencies, which we already just, we just alluded to. And um, what I showcased in a recent video on possible and likely mismanagement at Canada's tri councils, uh, we are now refining the recommendations, which include increasing the transparency of grant evaluation and selection procedures. Again, just catching up to what's happening in the Netherlands. I just saw today the main funding agency, NWO, for a recent call on open science infrastructure and open science uh, efforts that the grant evaluation details will be made public after the grant results are announced. And this is exactly what we're saying the Canadian government should do. They should also implement random audits to check transparency compliance. So again, if we're doing it for tax, we have tax audits to keep the everyday, uh, very, the everyday small person who doesn't even make a lot of money. We hold the everyday taxpayer to a higher uh, accountability standard than researchers who have huge stakes on the line and huge conflicts of interest and all the status and the tangible and non-tangible rewards that comes with being a professor and the million dollar book deals and the hundred thousand dollar talks and workshops and other side businesses. Uh, so it's not optional uh, if you, and if you don't provide the documentation when you are chosen for a random audit, uh, if you don't meet the transparency compliance, then you're in violation and you will get warnings and, and then investigated. And if you're found guilty, then you will be uh, blacklisted and banned from receiving public funding forever. So blacklists, I guess. You could call them, and it, sound, it sounds harsh, but again, this is taxpayer money that we don't have. <laughs> taxpayer money comes from somewhere. We're in the biggest debt ever. We don't have the luxury of giving money to these entitled academics who can then just go and waste it on whatever penis envy research or social penis uh, as a construct research. And finally, a wall of shame for non-compliant researchers uh, who would be blacklisted or are in, in violation. That feeds into the other recommendation of any fraud investigation. Information should also be made public, easily accessible, at the university's homepage in the footer and convicted and cleared. Okay, so that's the update and concrete actions, next steps we're taking. As you can see, we've got ginormous tasks ahead of us, huge forest fires to put out it's kind of like a multi-level, multi-layered forest fire. But it's it's contained, it's not spreading, it's contained and it's there's there's glimmers of hope. And and so we continue. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, 
please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.